And we are back. So um, we need to get to the heart of the matter now. We took a, a little bit of a, again, a very excellent, uh, in my opinion. Hopefully you found it too. Um, we were starting to talk about electrons, and then we got into particle wave duality and all of these uh, excellent things. But electrons, and specifically our valence electrons, really determine a lot of how a material bonds and then influences the structure and therefore properties, structure dictates properties, um, <laughs> which we'll be saying a, a lot. Um, so there's lots of information that you can kind of uh, gleam from orbitals and how essentially um, we fill in valence electrons and shells, and you probably have hopefully seen these or remember these um, a bit um, from your chemistry courses as I try to, let me, okay, ooh, 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 ooh. be careful, uh, just excuse me, but, uh, yeah, it's freaking out a little bit. Um, excellent, we got our back. Um, so filling in electron orbitals, um, hopefully those are reviewed. But they are those electrons and the valence electrons are really critical in determining uh, will we have covalent bonding, ionic bonding, metallic bonding, or other types of bonding, which we are going to refer to as um, basically a difference between intra and intermolecular bonds. So... Um, when we have no valence electrons, those are our inert or noble gases. And this would be a good time, actually, to introduce our um, periodic table, which we are going to look for. And actually, hopefully it is. Let's go ahead and try to upload this, or actually find it on our Canvas site. So let me, let's quickly log on to our canvas site and hopefully it will be uh let's go ahead let me ah oh, here we go let's go ahead and upload it here for a second excuse the uh the delay but it will be here in just a bit um let's go ahead and we will go ahead and find it Let's go ahead and put it in the notes. Find it here. Actually, let's go ahead. So actually, let's go ahead, let's open up. Um, actually, let's go to uh, my Humboldt. Actually, we're gonna go ahead and just log in. Oops, nope, we gotta go to my Humboldt. And then Let's go ahead, let's get to our Canvas site. And remember me. Let's send the push. No, no worries, we're gonna download this soon. Verify my identity. Again, you get to see all the fun, this fun process <laughs> in the video. <laughs> you can never say uh, it's not a spontaneous uh, uh, video lecture. <laughs> so let's go ahead and we will get into here. Let's look at our files. Let's look at our lectures. And then let's go ahead and download. Where's our periodic table? So this is the periodic table that we're going to utilize throughout this course. And we'll look over here. And we'll, let's type in periodic table. And let's insert our file. So. Um, again, this is the periodic table that we are going to utilize uh, throughout the course. Um, so be sure. Uh, let's see. Hopefully, it's a downloads here. Downloads here. We go. And let's do insert printout. So we are saying that if we have all of our valence electrons filled, we're an inert or a noble gas. Um, so we can actually hopefully remind ourselves of kind of the periodic table. And this is a very unique periodic table because it has a lot of additional information that are gonna be critical, that is gonna be critical for us um, in this course. So we can hopefully take a peek right here. We can look at crystal structures and all this good stuff. But we see here our noble gases are this column here in the table. Um, and actually we can scroll down to probably a more familiar approach. And you can see in the valence, in the shells, were completely full. So these are our noble gases 
Um, again, hopefully a reminder from some chemistry courses that you had um, previously taken. So um, the interesting part is the valence electrons, when those shells are not complete, that's going to be really critical when it comes to bonding. So when we look at um, bonding, we're going to be dealing with covalent bonding, ionic bonding, metallic bonding, and then these are all intramolecular, intramolecular. These, or in many other types, are intermolecular, between. Intra is within, intermolecular molecular is between. Um, but before we get into uh, kind of a lot of these details, one of the questions, like, why do atoms bond? Like, why does bonding occur in the first place? Um, well, this comes, uh, this brings us to one of the critical equations that we're going to see pop up over, uh, over and over and over in our course, which is life is governed by this equation. Hopefully you know, uh, it's our Gibbs free energy equation where Delta H is essentially our enthalpic or our energy term. Delta S is again, our entropic term. T is temperature. Again, ent entropy is not, again, we always kind of hear it taught as a measure measure of disorder. We're gonna be thinking about that in terms of the number of microstates, the number of unique ways that I could rearrange essentially my system. So why would bonding occur? Because if I bond, I'm basically saying these atoms are together, whereas this is one possible state. My second state is just stay apart. Like just bounce around into infinity, arrange, don't, you know, I'm not going to limit your configuration by having to be together. So why would, like, which state has more entropy? State two has a considerable amount of entropy because, again, there's no restrictions on how I could arrange them. So if I always want to lower my energy of my system, it doesn't make sense why I would ever choose part one or system or configuration one, bonding. The answer lies in when I bond, this enthalpy, the change in enthalpy when I go from unbound to bound will lower the energy of my system. And it's because of this um, overlap and attraction between these valence or potential attraction between these valence electrons. So we can actually quantify this um, and relate uh, this to a potential energy field um, or a potential energy landscape. And hopefully you remember from physics that force is going to be negative the gradient of energy. Um, or potential energy. So remember, this operator is effectively, if I have, for example, function y of x, this is effectively similar to dy dx, partial derivative. Um, and if it's multivariable, then you're going to have, uh, again, you're going to add on all those partial derivatives. So one of the ways that we can actually model bonding is from something very famous, which is our Leonard Jones potential. Um, so this is, again, describing essentially the potential energy between a pair of neutral atoms here. So this is our Leonard Jones potential. Um, and again, this is an interaction between a pair of neutral atoms. It is a very, very, very popular potential um, because as you can kind of see here, uh, again, I don't like to say equations or functions are <laughs> simple, but it's relatively simple and straightforward. We have a function. Basically, our U, I, I always kind of, you see VE or, you know, U. So I have my potential of Leonard Jones, which is simp is just a function of R, and I have two fitting parameters, epsilon and sigma. So again, this is potential. So the energy here has to be in units. And as you can see here, R is going to be obviously in meters. It's some distance. So that means sigma is some meter or distance parameter or fitting parameter. And epsilon, it can be either in electron volts or joules, and usually we want to always work in SI units, so um, joules. So just to kind of be aware of how that function works. And what you can see here is actually quite beautiful, and I, I would argue that it's relatively um, uh, straightforward. <laughs> what do I mean by that? This is showing essentially the interaction between two atoms. So if I have two atoms that are very, 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 say infinitely large distance apart, we're kind of asymptotically approaching an energy of zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, because like I have, they, those, those atoms really don't even see each other. If I get very, very, very close, those 
positive cores in my nucleus are going to start to kind of touch and they're going to want to repel. Again, high energy is bad. We don't want to be in a high energy state. And you see there's this kind of equilibrium distance here, which again, if my atoms are just touching, what is that distance between the center of this atom and the center of this atom? Well, if each atom has some radius r, it's just going to be 2r distance. So this is our minimum energy. This shows I get a negative energy. I can reduce my energy by uh, bonding. So again, going back to our everything is governed by Gibbs equation, that's how I reduce my enthalpy. That's why atoms uh, bond. So how could I find this distance you know, experimentally. Like, because again, what if this is an, I just have the function here, what, I, and I want to use this potential to figure out what atom I'm working with or what um, material I'm working with. Well, I can use Mathematica. So let's open it up. Fingers crossed, hope it works. <laughs> so we can solve it generally, but then we can also solve it uh, and plug in numbers. But again, let's just solve it generally. Um, so, how can I find this distance where my energy is minimized? Let me say that again. How can I take a function and find the position where that function is minimized? You got it. I'm going to take my derivative. Oops, I think it's... I'm going to take the derivative of my potential energy with respect to R and set it to zero and solve. So how can we do this in Mathematica? And again, you can do this with lots of other programs, but for symbolic programming, I think Mathematica is quite adept because it's it's very straightforward. So ULJ is just gonna be four times epsilon, epsilon times, and then let's just go sig divided by r to the 12th minus sig divided by r to the six. And I could shift enter and I see my function. And now I can take the derivative derivative of my function ulj with respect to r. That's my derivative. And now I can solve for when is this derivative equal to zero in terms of r. And I can see a bunch of values here. So let's say, for example, um, and you can just see, I'm not going to have negative values. So this is out, this is out, this is out, this is out. So really, this is going to be my equilibrium distance here. Because again, I need a realistic distance, so that's, I'm not going to have negative distances. We also said that force, right? Force is equal to negative, in this case, the derivative of my potential, ULJ, with respect to R. So how can I find out where my force is maximized? Well, what is, I, how can, again, let me say that again. How can I find where force is maximized? Well, I'm going to take the derivative of force with respect to r and solve for when this is equal to zero. And I can get an answer here as well. And if I had values, I could plug in and solve. But let's look at this conceptually. Force is equal to minus du dr. If I want to maximize force, I'm going to set df dr equal to zero, which is equal to minus d squared u dr squared is equal to zero. How do I know what is graphically, where can I find where the second derivative is zero? At my inflection point here, where I change from negative curvature to positive curvature. So here is actually the distance where my force is maximized, where the force between the, ad between the atoms is the largest. So that is bonding potentials and why do things bond? So. Um, we are going to get into intramolecular interactions uh, and dis discussing those on the next video and seeing how we can determine between different types of bonding and structure. See you next time. Thanks. Bye.